Well, uh, good afternoon, and thank you all so much for coming. My name is Nicholas Minidelli, and I'm the head of programming at the Lily and Goldman Law Library and a lecturer in legal research at Yale Law School. Uh, Professor Femi Cadmus, director of the Law Library, sends her regrets that she can't be here today. She was very excited about this book talk, and I know she'll be watching the recording. Um, so it's my honor to introduce our speaker, <coughs> Professor Anthony Cronman, Sterling Professor of Law. Professor Cronman first joined the Yale Law Faculty in 1978 and served at the Law School from 1994 until 2004. He teaches in the areas of constitutional law, contracts, legal philosophy, and law and religion. He also teaches literature, philosophy, history, and politics in the Directed Studies program at Yale College. He's the author or co-author of countless articles. His books include The Assault on American Excellence, Confessions of a Born Again Pagan, Education's End, Why Our Colleges and Universities Have Given Up on the Meaning of Life, and The Lost Lawyer. He holds a JD from the Yale Law School and a PhD in philosophy from Yale University. His most recent book, After Disbelief, is an exploration into the meaning of God in an age of disenchantment, and it's the subject of today's book talk. Reviewing the book for the Wall Street Journal, Andrew Stark, a professor at the University of Toronto, remarked that Professor Cronman writes evocatively and with insight, and that anyone who in our age of disbelief wants to believe in God will find in After Disbelief uh, worth reading. Professor Carmen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation to uh, speak, and thanks to all of you for coming. The title of the book was inspired by a poem by Philip Larkin, a very beautiful poem called Church Going. Some of you may may know it. In it, he describes his... uh, habit of visiting run-down um, uh, churches in ill repair in obscure corners of the United uh, Kingdom and, uh, and uh, what, he, what he finds in them. And I, I thought maybe it would help to set the mood if I read just a couple of stanzas from the, uh, the poem because I, in many ways, share Larkin's uh, curiosity about... Uh, about uh, the forms of religious life. So he, uh, he reports that most of the churches he finds or stumbles on don't look worth visiting at all, but goes on to say that, he, in fact, he does stop uh, and, uh, and uh, spend some time exploring. So he writes, yet, yet stop I did, he's talking about a particular church, yet stop I did, in fact, I often do, and always end much at a loss like this, wondering what to look for, wondering, too, when churches will fall completely out of use, what we shall turn them into. If we shall keep a few cathedrals chronically on show, their parchment plate and picks in locked cases, and let the rest rent free to rain and sheep, shall we avoid them as unlucky places. Or after dark will dubious women come to make their children touch a particular stone, pick simples for a cancer, or on some advised night see walking a dead one. Power of some sort will go on in games, in riddles, seemingly at random, but superstition like belief must die. And what remains when disbelief has gone? Grass, weedy pavement, brambles, buttress, sky. A shape less recognizable each week, a purpose more obscure. I wonder who will be the last, the very last, to seek this place for what it was. One of the crew that tap and jot and know what rude lofts were. Some ruin bibber, randy for antique, or Christmas addict, counting on a whiff of gown and bands and organ pipes and myrrh. Or will he be my representative, bored, uninformed, knowing the ghostly silt dispersed, yet tending to this cross of ground, 
through suburb scrub because it held unspilt so long and equably what since is found only in separation, marriage and birth and death and thoughts of these. For which was built this special shell? For though I've no idea what this accountered, frousty barn is worth, it pleases me to stand in silence here. A serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blant air all our compulsions meet, are recognized and robed as destinies, and that much never can be obsolete. Since someone, and I felt at this point the poet was talking to right to my heart, since someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious and gravitating with it to this ground, which he once heard was proper to grow wise in, if only that so many dead lie round. I wrote after disbelief during the first year of the pandemic on my home in Block Island. It's a short book about God and the human condition. The book is small, but the topics are large, and I thought I would take a few minutes and say a few words about each. First, God. When we hear the word, we tend to think of the God of Abraham, in whom Jews, Christians, and Muslims all believe, of course, with some famous disagreements. In the West, at least, this is the idea of God, the worst, the word most immediately and often calls to mind. This idea of God pictures God as a personal creator who exists before and apart from the world. The God of Abraham is not the world itself, but its author. He brings it into being from nothing through an act of will. He loves his creatures and looks out for them, especially his human ones, though we seem to be continually disappointing his expectations. This is not the only way to think about God, however. It is an interpretation of a more general concept. We don't need to look beyond the West to the religions of Asia, about which I know very little in any case, to see that the Abrahamic idea of God, uh, excuse me, to see that the idea of God is wider than the Abrahamic version of it. It is enough to consider what the idea meant in the West, in the Occident, before the triumph of Abrahamic and more specifically Christian belief. The greatest philosophers of Occidental antiquity believed in God as well. Plato and Aristotle and their classical successors use the word and the idea throughout their writings. But Aristotle's God in particular, which I've always had a special attraction, is very different from the Abrahamic one. Aristotle's God is not a creator or a person. It has no will and does not exist apart from the world at all. To simplify grossly, one might say that Aristotle's God is just the order of the world itself, what we might call its, its resident intelligibility. The differences between this God and the God of Abraham are striking. The history of the West records the long, sometimes collaborative, often bitter confrontation between these two conceptions of God. Yet despite their very profound differences, these two ideas share something vital in common. Seeing what this is, the common thread, frees us from the parochial identification of the idea of God, the concept of God, 
with the narrower Abrahamic interpretation of it to which we have all become so accustomed after centuries of deep uh, uh, habit. What these two ideas of God, the Aristotelian and the Abrahamic, share is the conviction that the most fundamental of all distinctions is that between time and eternity. Some things pass away, others do not. The former are exposed to the wasting power of time, the latter are immune. Aristotle's God and its Abrahamic counterpart both belong in the latter category. They share an invulnerability to time. The defining mark of both gods, Aristotle's and the God of Abraham, is their eternal being or eternal reality. Now, we all have a loose sense of what time means. It means one thing following another, often, not always, but often as its effect. It means the succession of events. But what does eternity mean? One thing it means is everlasting. What goes on without end is eternal. This isn't true of anything in time, but it is true of time itself, of the endless flow in which things emerge and vanish. Like all the, unlike all the events and objects in time, time itself, the frame that contains what happens in it, never begins and it never ends. It is everlasting. But eternity has a second meaning too. In addition to everlasting, it means roughly that which exists completely apart from time. Mathematical truths are an example. Their truth has nothing to do with time, with before and after, or cause and effect. They transcend time altogether. If they are everlastingly true, eternally true in the first sense, that's because their truth is wholly unconditioned by time, because it is eternal in the second sense. Anything that is true in this second sense exists by necessity. It is not causally contingent. It cannot not be and therefore must be at every moment in an everlastingly long time. Eternality in the second sense and derivatively in the first is the defining characteristic of God both for Aristotle and his Abrahamic successors. For both, God is the being who exists by necessity, who cannot not be, and whose reality is therefore everlastingly as real today as it will be in an endless succession of tomorrows. Here we find a conception of God that rises above partisan disputes even the deepest divide of all, the one that separates the philosophers of pagan antiquity from the theologians of revealed religion. It is a conception of God whose generality offers some hope of throwing light on the human condition, not as it once was or is today, at one time or in one place, but always and everywhere. With that, let me turn to the human condition, my second topic. What distinguishes human beings from other animals? It's a familiar, uh, uh, old, and uh, perplexing question. Well, one thing, I believe, separates us before all others. Like other living things, like all of them as far as we can tell, we die. Of course we do. But we alone know we will. The poet Alexander Pope called it the useless knowledge of our end. Useless, perhaps, 
uh, unsettling for sure. The knowledge of our mortality sets us apart. It conditions every human experience insofar as it is distinctively human and is the inspiration for all science, art, and culture, and for law as well. This knowledge is possible only because we are at once caught in the stream of time, carried along by it, and aware that we are. This awareness in turn is possible only because we are not wholly the prisoners of time, but can see it, with our minds at least, from a distance. We can see that our brief lives occupy but a tiny span in a much longer interval, and that this interval in turn is but a tiny span in a still longer one, and so on ad infinitum. Because of this, we can conceive of time going on forever, even though we ourselves do not. We can conceive of time everlasting. Indeed, we can't help but do so. The idea of time everlasting is born with the knowledge of death. They are the two sides of a single coin. Even more strikingly, the same detachment from time enables us to conceive of objects and ideas that are not conditioned by time at all, that exist independently of time and never move or change, that are never brought into being by an antecedent cause and never cease to be, of mathematical truths and other things, including God, that exist by necessity and therefore cannot not be. Now, this is wonderful, meaning t terrific and good and, uh, and extraordinary and, and, and slightly terrifying too. This is wonderful in obvious ways. It allows us to do all sorts of things we could not do otherwise, to plan for the future in a deliberate way, for, for example, either on a small or on a grand scale. But it is also the source of a unique species of disappointment to which we human beings alone are prey. Disappointment in the ordinary sense is an everyday experience. I plan to, um, to um, organize a, a picnic tomorrow, but the weather spoils my plans. What could be more uh, ordinary? Other animals know disappointment of this kind too. Uh, the dog chases the ball I've thrown and it goes down a gopher hole and disappears. Big disappointment. The dog wanted one thing and failed to get it and there's nothing but sadness in the meadow. Uh, um, um, but there is another kind of disappointment which though also familiar in one sense, is quite extraordinary in another, and only human beings ever experience it. In After Disbelief, I call it deep disappointment. This is the disappointment that arises from our inability to reach goals we can conceive, can frame, can uh, 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 set for ourselves, indeed feel compelled to set for ourselves, but that inevitably lie beyond our capacity to achieve. A goal, for example, that would take an endless time to reach and whose attainment would mean that we were at last able to understand why what before had seemed transitory and accidental is in fact necessarily so, why it cannot not be. A goal of that kind uh, creates deep disappointment. We can set it, we're drawn to it, uh, we yearn to reach it, but we cannot. It lies forever beyond our power to accomplish that program. Now, I put all of that very abstractly, but uh, the uh, age-old effort to comprehend the order of the world, what we loosely call science, fits the pattern exactly. 
One of the remarkable things about science, though, is that even if we are bound to be deeply disappointed in our longing to understand the world, even if more work will always remain to be done, we're able to make progress nonetheless. This is a real paradox. How can we make progress toward a goal, yet whenever we break off or, uh, uh, or uh, take a moment to uh, uh, reassess and gather strength again, find ourselves at the same infinite distant, distance from the goal as we were before. But that experience is the essence of science, whose paradoxical character reflects the paradox of our situation as beings who are able to transcend time in one way, yet are permanently caught in it in another. In After Disbelief, I tried to show that romantic love, romantic love, fits this same pattern too. Now that, I'm sure to you listening to me talk and uh, to readers of the book, will seem a stretch. What do science and love have to do with one another? I'm convinced, odd as it sounds, that modern romantic love shares a great deal in common with the impersonal work of scientific research, including, most strikingly, its vulnerability to deep disappointment. And I'm <clears throat> not going to try and explain all of that in the few minutes that I, few minutes more that I plan to take. Perhaps we can discuss it in the question and answer session after I'm done. I'll conclude instead with three observations, which, each of which touches on an important theme in the book. First, deep disappointment is the mark of the human condition. But deep disappointment is possible only because we cannot help but think of our mortal selves, so brief and accidental, in relation to what lasts forever and exists by necessity in relation to eternity in both senses of the word. Put differently, deep disappointment exists only because we are oriented in our essential being to what Aristotle calls the everlasting and divine, or more simply, to God. Our orientation to God is constitutive of the human condition. Without it, there could be no deep disappointment, and without that, no humanity at all. Second, different as they are, the wisdom philosophies of pagan antiquity and the Abrahamic religions all promise relief from the awkwardness and pain of deep disappointment. Plato and Aristotle say that relief is possible in this life if we just think clearly enough. Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Maimonides, and Al-Ghazali, among a hundred others, say it's not possible in this life to overcome your liability to deep disappointment, but hope is right around the corner. You will be unburdened of that awful, painful condition in the next life when you are face-to-face uh, -face with God. So all of these very great thinkers in one way or another preach a gospel of hope, the deep disappointment. We are not stuck with it forever. It's tough. We're in it maybe as long as we live, although Aristotle and Plato didn't think e even that, but it is not our permanent final state. There's something better around the corner. They all say that we must and can overcome the condition of deep disappointment, which is the human condition, rather than accept it as our fate. They are all, in this sense, anti-humanistic. And I reject them all, all of them, the entire kit and caboodle, for that reason. 
The third observation will cause you to recoil in, dare I use the word, disbelief. Uh, I've been talking about the human condition. I've said that it can't be explained without reference to the idea of eternity. But this is all internal to us. It's only a matter, one might say, of human psychology, even if the psychology is rather deep. What, if anything, does the phenomenon of deep disappointment, the experience of it, our experience of it, imply about the world as it is in itself, independently of our experience? I am persuaded that the only way to explain the existence of the human condition to answer the question of how it is possible that the world contain beings such as we, with our liability to deep disappointment, is on the assumption which we cannot help but make about the world as it is in itself, that the world is eternal in both senses of the word, world and that everything that happens in the world under the sign of time unfolds with the same necessity as a mathematical proof. So that even the least of things, the falling of a sparrow in the words of the gospelist, cannot not be. Now that's a theological conclusion, to put it mildly. The theology behind it, though, is not that of Aristotle, nor of, or of Plato, nor of any of his Abrahamic successors, Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. It is a theology that offers enlightenment, but promises no relief from this deep disappointment. It is a humanistic theology. It is the theology of the most original and inventive thinker in the history of the West. I am referring to Spinoza, the hero of my book. For those of you who have an interest in modern European philosophy and some knowledge of the subject, I could summarize the whole argument of my book by saying very cryptically that in my view, Spinoza's theology is a precondition necessary for the possibility of Kant's transcendental anthropology. But now I'm hiding a shocking conclusion behind a smokescreen of philosophical jargon, and that is my cue to quit.